My name is Michael, also known as N Commander, and we are talking about the Unseen World of Power PC, which is also the name of the exhibit that's down in the main uh, exhibit hall. So just as a show of hands, how many people are at least somewhat familiar with Power PC? Yeah, that's pretty much what I expected. <laughs> so um, would someone here would like to try to define what Power PC was? Because my definition is going to be very different than the standard one. So do I have a volunteer? OK. Yeah. You get another list architecture to try to take over you know, from when you tell them not <laughs> You know, that's actually very close, because my answer was it was, the Ill, it was a product of an ill-fated industry alliance. PowerPC was the product of, let's hear. Well, it's easier to show you the splash screen. So this is the startup screen from my, my RS6000s. And if you look at the copyright message, there's something there that may not supposed to be there on a business machine. That's specifically the Apple computer. And the reason for that, the reason for that is PowerPC was IBM's last major attempt to retake the market after they started losing control to the clone manufacturers. They had first tried with MCA. They had their in-house power architecture, which they then worked with Motorola to f and Apple to form the AIM Alliance. So the whole point of the AIM Alliance was to essentially beat, uh, essentially compete uh, for the desktop against Microsoft and Intel. It was also insurance. Industry logic at the time was that complex process, or sorry, complex instruction set, uh, the x86 processors were going to have a limit of how far they could grow. There is some logic to this because the number of transistors you need to implement a complex decoder gets larger and larger the faster you go, there is more heat. Even today, x86 processors generally trail behind ARM, although uh, Intel has made huge strides especially in their Atom line. So the AIM Alliance was basically industry thinking Intel is going to die, and as we all know, Intel did not die. Um, and we've already covered this slide. So what machines do you think of when I talk PowerPC? And there's two general categories. Like, can I get some names? Like, someone shout out a name. Xbox. Uh, Macintoshes, Xbox. I actually completely forgot about the Wii. Uh, my answers were uh, Power Mac and the PlayStation 3, which was technically PowerPC based, since Cell is a variant of PowerPC. Um, but did anyone think about, oh, I don't know, this? <laughs> because this was the future we were promised, and thus this is proof that we are not in the worst possible timeline. <laughs> and thus I would show you the world we didn't get, or more specifically, the failures we didn't see. Who remembers this one? <laughs> uh, Tal Talgant was a combination with Apple, uh, IBM Apple partnership, to explore object-oriented programming and design. It was, I'm not exactly sure what they were trying to do. They made a lot of paperwork that said nothing about it. Um, and while it wasn't directly related to this disaster, also known as Copeland, um, there were a lot of things that were promised that we never saw, such as Workspace OS, which was the grand unifying theory of operating systems. Instead of having multiple operating systems, you would have one operating system that could run them all. And uh, yeah, the beta was delayed. And you know, there were, there were definitely some mistakes made in hindsight. <laughs> Together with IBM, Motorola annou earlier announced that it would stop developing new PowerPC um, machines that use Microsoft's uh, rival NT operating system. In turn, Microsoft said it will drop development of NT for the PowerPC chip. I think about this sounds about itself, because uh, we all know how that one played out. So realistically, there's a lot of broken promises here. It does exist, and we are going to explore what does exist, but what was promised and what we got were two very different things. So by and large, not counting consoles or realistically what I call embedded devices since consoles are not meant to be end user programmable, Apple was the only one that really got PowerPC equipment to end users. IBM had some, uh, it had what was called the personal power, uh, the personal power series and that was essentially a handful of essentially replaced PS2 motherboards and ThinkPads that ran AIX and PowerPC, uh, PowerPC chips. 
They could also run NT and OS2 as well as Solaris. And yeah, we will get to Solaris PowerPC because that is a thing. Um, so to sum this up, the hype never shipped, surprising pretty much no one. However, if you've been in the, there is all the hype and thus, welcome to Comdex 2001, <laughs> the year we killed x86, on display in the dining room. Ignore the fine print. But first, uh, let me introduce myself, because I'm not certain how many people are actually familiar with me. I am N Commander, and I am mostly known for doing horrible things to vintage computers. More specifically, um, I take them apart and figure out what is true versus what is fiction. Um, a lot of what I work with, most people would prefer to forget, such as everything related to titanium. And um, yeah, there's... <laughs> I have no reservations understand, knowing what some people think about some of the horrors I have put myself through. No one should read Itanium Disassembly, no one. But I do think there's overall value here because fundamentally speaking, what we would, the modern computer and the, essentially the internet were the birthplace of Bell Labs, ARPANET, so forth. The specifics you can vary, but it's within one human generation all of this has come to bear. And the truth of the matter is a lot of the history is just disappearing. I mean, for anyone who is familiar with mini computers, you will be, you'll know that a lot of it's gone. Look at all the effort Asagi Electric has been putting through to get that Centurion going, and that's just one of many. Like a lot of, deck stuff is relatively well preserved, although most of the source code's been lost, and a lot of the other ones, they've only been preserved in recent years, such as uh, complete versions of incompatible time sharing and so forth. Other things that were based on custom hardware, such as MIT's CTCSS, is essentially lost except for the documentation. So while these systems still work, I want to document them. So that's essentially what I'm known for in Vintage Unix. I do do a lot of other things besides this. I've used the handle and commander for 20 years. Um, most notably, I used to work in a major Linux company. Uh, I'm not going to say it here, but if you look at my bio, you can find it. Um, I also used to work at Beam, which was a video streaming company that became Mixer. And while there, I developed the FTL uh, streaming protocol. So I do understand quite a bit of the low-level technical knowledge because I'm quite li I have quite literally gone sub-second video performance out of the internet. So I like to think uh, at least I know what I'm talking about. Um, I also am known for doing one other thing. This is not something your debugger should ever give you. This has happened to me multiple times on multiple platforms. This was on Itanium, but it's a sad when you have to GDB, GDB. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that's really how it goes. And obviously, I've already talked about Space Cadet Pinball. So on that note, at VCF, there's usually someone who has the first equipment to smoke. It turns out it was me this year. This arrived. It was completely good to go as much as it was going to when it left my apartment on Thursday. It has failed twice since it's got here and is currently, all things being held together, all things being equal, I will maybe have it do something after this talk. But I also, every time I've said that, this machine has found new and interesting ways to die on me. <laughs> uh, but let's talk about the three beasts. So this is the newest of the three beasts and probably if you're familiar with my channel, this is the one you're going to remember. This is the IBM RS6000 43P Model 150. It is pretty much the, la it's not the last, but it's right at the end of when IBM basically pulled the plug on anything that wasn't uh, millions of dollars price. Um, the machine actually came from VCF. It was, I found it in consignment in 2021, and the entire reason I bought it is I wanted to run NT for PowerPC not realizing that two IBM machines with almost identical model numbers have absolutely nothing related to each other. <laughs> so that was, that was my first experience with buying IBM hardware. I had inherited it, but this was my first purchasing. I'm glad to see that the experience has been kept true. So basic specifications, it's a 650 megahertz, not hertz, PowerPC 604E. Uh, I had a bunch of extra, extra memory, so it all went in there. Uh, it came with a 10.6 gigabyte hard drive, which still works, and from what I can tell, is the factory original drive. And that's impressive when I tell you how long the system was in use for. 
Uh, officially, it supported AIX 4.3, uh, 5L, and at least officially, IBM said it would run Linux. I have not actually managed to do it. Uh, the video card dies every time. It probably would work over serial. So to say this machine had a long service life is kind of impressive. It ran for 15 years. Um, I, when I got it, I dumped the hard drive. There was a copy of Oracle 7 on it and the install log and the uptime. It had been running reports quarterly. I think it must have been installed in 2001 and it just kept running. No one had installed updates. It was its original factory 4.1 install. I don't know if the machine was purchased in 2001. That's just when AIX was installed. So, and trust me, the fans on hard drive do sound like they've been running for 15 years. <laughs> uh, so, if you want to know what that fabulous, bought, what that cost in 2001, there it is, right off IBM.com. And finding that was not easy. And I, it didn't even, I don't even have the mod for it. But you, um, there's, this is a question that has brought up some contention, is AIX was the most expensive of the Unix options. You paid, you not only paid the Unix premium, you paid the IBM premium on top of that. There is quite a bit to say for AIX and IBM, and I do consider it probably the highlight of this era, because AIX does set a standard for reliability that very few operating systems can hold up to. It will also, it will also make your sale, IBM sales rep very happy because you'll pay a lot on support contracts. <laughs> Trust me as someone who has tried to get GL working. <laughs> so realistically speaking, AX is a System 5, I believe it's release free variant. So it predates uh, what I call the Solera standard, which is basically what everything in the 90s used. Uh, AX itself actually dates back, I want to say initial release was 88 for the RTPC, but it may have been earlier. It was then ported to IBM's power architecture, then to PS2 and x86, jumped back to PowerPC, did a small stint on mainframes, and now it is back on power because it has to run on everything IBM, apparently. Um, it was generally exclusive to IBM, although there, there have been exceptions to that. There was a licensed version by Apple who, um, Apple didn't have a server product, uh, and Mac OS X server actually has problems being a server at least in its early days due to performance. So Apple's solution was to literally just turn one of their Power Macs into an IBM box by changing the firmware, and they shipped AIX with Apple Talk compatibility. That, they, they, they slapped an Apple badge on it. Motorola is a little bit more interesting. Motorola had specific AIX releases. It had uh, PowerStack, AIX, 4.1, R4. Now, I haven't been able to check this one out, because the previous owner did something I've never seen on a vintage computer before. They updated the firmware, and thus it will not run the original CD anymore. And I, I, I'm not brave enough to reflash what is considered a unicorn as is. <laughs> so if you've got an EEPROM programmer and want to help me, please get in touch. Um, what is currently running, or what I tried to run, is AIX 4.3.2a, which is essentially the alternate release. It was supported the Bull, Estra, and a few others. It's missing a lot of the IBM-ness, but has all the bugs. It's about the best way I can describe it. Um, like, Xhost is missing. Like, all those useful utilities that you expect to be on your Unix, either they were on a second CD that they didn't come with it, or they just didn't ship it. But lack of quality assurance has unfortunately been the order of the day as far as that table goes. So, as far as baseline goes, while I sound like I'm probably overly critical of AIX, trust me, there are worse train wrecks I could drag up on stage, um, it has the virtue of both working and existing. And it is also well documented enough at this point that we can even emulate it. Uh, it's a little bit hit or miss in emulation, but 4.3 and later have been emulated, and my, my biggest guess is probably no one wants to figure out how microchannel works in PowerPC to prevent emulating the older versions, but not exactly the biggest problem. Now, I'm gonna pause here because I've gone through a lot of information and the, um, this is the most well-known machine. So I'm gonna take questions up to this point for the next minute or so, if any. Going once, going twice. I, I'm sorry. Uh, microchannel architecture, so to back up slightly, um, 
one of the biggest problems that IBM went through in the 80s and 90s is they lost control of the PC market they helped create. Uh, the PC itself was created by a small team in Boca Raton and was designed to be, um, for want of a better word, cheap. And really the only, off the, the only proprietary part of the IBM PC was the software. And realistically, it only took about a year before Compact had a 100% reverse engineered alternative. IBM tried to introduce changes to the PC architecture that the clone manufacturers, and this is getting into a completely different talk, but it's relevant. Um, the clone manufacturers basically said no and other words past that point, uh, which basically led to the point that the PC architecture in the late 80s split into what could be called the ISA branch and the microchannel branch. End users generally didn't get to see this, but as someone who plays around in what's called Ring Zero, uh, I have words uh, that I will not put on hit film about this. But in practice, IBM was demanding a lot of money from the clone manufacturers, so, the, I, so they basically decided to do a uh, play an Uno reverse card. They created ESA, they created the VESA local bus, and then finally everyone agreed to use PCI, and the whole and everyone tried to forget the last five years. Uh, because PowerPC was intended to be the successor to x86 and was also insurance in case Intel decided to basically pick up Spall and go home, a, the, a long-standing fear of IBM, which is part of why the Free86 was so late to show up in IBM hardware, that microchannel on PowerPC seems weird, but you also realize it actually predates PCI. And do you really want to have all the intricacies of jumpers and IRQ conflicts on a completely new platform? Like, it's, it was supposed to be the future, but not this future. So this is, the, um, this is where we learn that IBM's naming scheme is fascinating, because you'd think that a machine that literally changes between, the literally difference between this one should be, and the previous machine should be 10, but they have almost nothing in common. Uh, aside from the back, they're both RS6000s, they run AIX, and they have a PowerPC chip, because, yeah. Uh, this one also came from VCF. It was a swap meet item. And uh, this one actually was working and booting, although it had a dead hard drive when I got it. So what I learned is I wanted to run NT on this, but this machine was a little bit too new to run NT. I learned that if you swap the right parts out in the right order, <laughs> it can be done. <laughs> It gets, funny enough, the model number has an off by one error. Uh, it's supposed to be a 70, 70 and I don't, oh, sorry, 70 that, that was the previous model. I don't know why. Microsoft has one how. Every PowerPC. No, that, that actually will change. The how quarries, that, that gets quarried in ARC. I can see this in ARC. Yeah, so I don't know where it's getting it. I, yeah. So, um, oh boy. So, the, this was a live stream that I did. I think it, it the, the, major, the major trick here is that the built-in video card, which is a GTX 255, it, which is a, I believe it's a rebadge Matic card. Uh, I basically pulled that out. I put a more period correct card in and it kicked to life eventually. It's still not very happy, although surprisingly it has not blue screen the entire time it, I'm here. And I probably just tempted fate. It's probably a blue screen right now. But um, this system was originally used as a pe for, by a Texas petrochemical company. Um, they were using it for simulating oil uh, pressures and such. So uh, it's kind of neat that it ended up here, although I have no idea how it ended up in New Jersey. You'd think it'd still be down in Texas. So uh, let's talk about NT for PowerPC. Uh, uh, yeah, no, NT for PowerPC. So I'm assuming most of this room is familiar with NT. The thing is that NT was never meant to run on Intel processors. This was originally, how do I want to put this? This was originally the, as originally envisioned, NT was called Portable OS 2 because it started life as a joint partnership between IBM and Microsoft. Um, the original OS 2 was extremely tied to x86. It was basically a direct extension of the 16-bit DAWs code. So portability was not even a concept when a lot of it was originally written. So, this is where the idea of Workplace OS and NT came, is that you would create a new, uh, new operating system that could run all the old applications. And NT was essentially uh, Microsoft's first attempt at doing so. 
after the IBM Microsoft divorce of the 90s, um, uh, IBM decided to try again. However, for whatever reason, I've not actually figured out why this exists because I would think Microsoft maybe, like, from what I can tell, Motorola paid Microsoft to port NT, but I've always been surprised that Motorola did that. So, you know, who knows? Um, of the four ports, it is, and the four ports being x86, alpha, MIPS, uh, x86, alpha, MIPS, and PowerPC, uh, this is the least love. I'm not convinced any human who didn't work in either software development or quality assurance have ever touched this product <laughs> because those parts work fine. It's the everything else that's broken. Um, part of it's because I'm running it on a Frankenstein system, but the, the one that really got me is the onboard chipset for the Ethernet controller is an AMD PCNet 2 chip. It is a very common chip that pretty much half the computers in consignment have. Uh, when I load that driver, the whole screen blue, the whole thing blue screens. It dumps into the kernel debugger, and I have checked. It dies in the driver. I tried a PCI card that was also the same chipset, and it died in new and interesting ways that were completely unrelated to the first crash. At this, on attempt three, I just gave up with the onboard Ethernet, found a Freecom Etherlink 3 PCI card, put that in, and finally I had working network. So, yeah, quality assurance. Um, it's a word that they probably know about. Uh, on top of that, there's no software. Um, this is a combination to probably one of the worst development environments I have personally used. And the fact that the product was on the market for less than a year before it was axed. Like, this was impressively short shelf life even by 90s. So, what do you do when you have no software? And the obvious option is you sit on the desktop and you look pretty as an exhibit because you, know, you have the built-in applications, you have pinball. Or you can do what I did, and you just, you know, write your own. So this, this was pain. Um, for those who are familiar with programming Windows, you are no doubt familiar with Visual C++. This is not the Visual C++ that you are familiar with. This is the, I don't know where these tools escape from. It's bad. So. The most notable problem with this is that the, there's four separate versions of Visual Studio for each of the four architectures. So you have the PowerPC, the MIPS, the Alpha, and then the regular one we all used on x86. They don't share file formats. They can't open each other's project spaces from what I can tell. And the most recent release is Visual C++ 4, which really tells me that if you were a software developer in the 90s who wants to support the NT ports, good luck. Uh, that's not counting the fact that Microsoft charged a premium for these versions of development tools. As far as I could tell, you could only get them through an MSDN subscription and a few thousand dollars on top of that. And so they really didn't want you to have this. Like, I don't know if that was, you know, I have that feeling that we'll sell the development tools and no one actually thought about it beyond that point, but if anyone knows, please let me know. So after tracking down all the bits, and trust me, this took a while, uh, I got Hello working on March 7th. The second thing I managed to do was I actually managed to support the SDL library. And for those who don't know, that's the Simple Direct Media Library. It's an abstraction layer between application code and the operating system. It's actually how I got Doom running on the RS6000 Model 150 uh, originally about a year ago. So SDL has probably been ported to almost every platform. I would say it's actually at this point, it's probably been poured more than Tetris. Uh, there's still a few things it hasn't been poured to, but all the major game consoles, like if you ever played a source port for Dreamcast, it was probably using SDL, same for OG Xbox, so forth and so on, since it is a very simple abstraction layer. I did have to gut it somewhat because unfortunately, the PowerPC build is missing a lot of functionality you take for granted. Uh, one of the big flaws of Windows NT, and this was actually not fixed until Windows 2000, was it had notoriously bad graphics performance. Um, this was partially due to the microkernel design and partially because the idea of PC graphics had not, PC graphics without direct hardware access was not something anyone had asked at that point. Because remember, on the PC side, we were still enjoying, EJ was still around when this uh, system shipped. Like it was on the tail end, but EGA cards would have been still common. VGA was coming onto the market, and this thing called SVGA was coming. 
or well, it was there, but it was becoming more affordable. So graphics performance for NT really wasn't seen as a priority because this wasn't a system that end users were going to use. It was either going to be in the back office, and that's actually what Microsoft sold it as, uh, their back office product, which included Exchange and SQL Server, or the client version, which would be running on normal workstations. Uh, because then you had the ability to sign into domain, you had memory protection, and in practice, the only graphical capability that most businesses need to use is Excel. So this wasn't as bad as it sounds, and I don't have a photo of it, but while there are no native applications besides some that Microsoft shipped, it actually has a licensed copy of Insignia Soft PC. So NTVDM is present, it will run DAWs and 16-bit Windows application, albeit with a massive performance penalty. So if you happen to inherit this system, I can't imagine the circumstances that would involve this, if you want to install Office 4.3, it would work. And there was even, I don't know why Microsoft did this, Internet Explorer 5.5 from 2001 had a 16-bit release. I don't know why they shipped it, but it's there. So it will run on this, although I do not have it installed. So the largest problem with figuring this out is you are dealing with something that is not particularly well documented. I, my, I would, to build SDL normally, you either need to use auto tools because it's a configure script, or there's a bunch of Visual C projects for version six, and you can't downgrade. So what I ended up doing is I loaded up Visual C++ 6 on Windows 2000. Inside there, I can go tools and export a make file. And so there's a utility in the SDK called mmake, which is essentially a re-implementation of the old BSD make command. I could then go through the make file, edit out all the x86 specific bits, and trust me, that took quite a while to figure out because this compiler has the same, it has options that are very similar to x86, but just different enough that it will bite you in the rear if you don't catch it. So I think it took me about four days to get a sample library going, and then this was another day for it. I also had to rip out all the DirectX code. Um, this is the era of Windows where only OpenGL was supported. Uh, it is in theory accelerated. I haven't actually been able to prove that. But the 3D May screensaver does appear to be running with OpenGL acceleration and at least loads, although I can't tell if it's running on software or CPU rendering. I think it's on the processor. So the next thing I did after that, I got Doom running. Um, this wasn't, this was more annoying than hard um, at this point because I really just had to recreate all the project files. And as you can see, April 6th, I was getting towards VC, you know, I, we were getting close to event and it's like, Okay, I need this all taken care of, but uh, it didn't quite go that way. So I got it all working, and today you can see it down there, and it's been running quite well. I got some advice literally on the show floor that helped a lot with the performance. So on average, I'd say it does about 25 frames per second, which considering it's a 200 megahertz power PC, it should be a lot faster. But Windows NT is also that garbage with graphics driving, so uh, I guess that's about where it's supposed to be, plus I'm not convinced this is a particularly good compiler. Like, I don't think it's putting out particularly optimized code. So, uh, yeah, I already covered all this, the unloved stepchild of the PowerPC world. So, there are some interesting bits about it. The port runs in little Endian mode, and this breaks every single check and every software I ever tried running on it, because most platforms look if it's PowerPC and assumes the byte order is most significant word first. Not here. Motorola did support this on the chip. It was documented. I know one commercial application that used this functionality that was actually a virtual PC. Um, this has caused no end of pain because this breaks every assumption for code that looks it's on PowerPC and not. <coughs> I'm sorry. And um, I haven't figured out why they did this aside from being compatible with x86. That's like the only reason. It's, a, it's enough of a reason, but it's like, ow. <laughs> like, you know, that being said, of the four platforms, PowerPC was the only one that even tried to be Big Endian. You had x86, Alpha was little, MIPS could be coded either way, but in general, most people ran it in little Endian mode for x86 compatibility. And the one thing that most people don't seem to know is that PowerPC, PowerPC support was actually on the stock CD. If you take the retail release of any 3.351 3 
or 4 CD. Uh, it's right there, which I'm actually kind of surprised in hindsight that no one tried to figure out how to get this working on a Power Mac back in the day. There were people that used to do some, a lot of reverse engineering hacks, and the NT kernel is well documented enough even then that it should have been possible. Uh, I'm not, well, no, I'm not going to say that I'm not crazy enough, but I'm not doing it today. Uh, so, this was, so this basically boiled down to a whole lot of live streaming and dealing with pre-standard C++ code. Uh, and all its glory. And then we have the last one. And the last one is the most fascinating of the three beasts. It's also the one that, the power stack. So the power stack is the only one that didn't come from VCF. And maybe that's why it's been having problems. This was, this was offered as a donation for my research. And um, I'm happy I accepted it, but it has been a source of unending pain in my life. So when it arrived, it came in two pieces. The top part actually does destack, hence the name. You're, the whole idea is that you could apparently just hook up more, I guess, up to the SCSI bus. Um, and with a, it is not what I call, hold on, I actually put a word of warning. I should actually remember, oh yes. If you want to exhibit a unicorn, make sure you have lots of glitter, because this is what happened. Because every time I tried to do something with the machine to show it being unique, it found new ways to die. And this led to someone, this, this was literally a quip that was told to me earlier today, and I had to add it here, is when you have the unicorn running, it is very camera shy. And it's like, yeah, yeah. Um, honestly, I would love to say a lot more about the system. I'm going to say plenty as is, but I don't think I can confine it to the slide deck. So let, let me throw away the slides for a bit, and let's talk about it. So, is anyone here familiar with Motorola's VME architecture? That was essentially their embedded device stuff. Okay, so there is one. Um, this is essentially the same thing and has different, slightly different form factor. Its bootloader is PP, PPC1 bug, which is not so much a bootloader as a debugger that can load binary files. Uh, as like all the wonderful breakpoint instruction stepping stuff that you want in a debugger, but I've never seen it stock in a bootloader before this that wasn't on an embedded device. Um, like Sun Systems, it has a battery that in its NVRAM chip that um, was dead when I got it. Amazingly, it is a standard part that I could get on Amazon of all places. What is missing are the really handy instructions that generations of Sun users have ran up on how to deal with this problem. So I only partially have it reprogrammed because I don't know what the original looked like. So there's a whole bunch of fields where it asks for manufacturer information data. So unless someone else has one of these systems and I can compare what the working version looks like to what I have, it's going to be a little bit unhappy. And I do suspect that's part of why this machine has been the basket case that it has. I have run AIX on it. I have run Solaris on it. I'm not going to run NT on it. And next up is the specifications. Um, mostly because I don't know why they did this. NT normally, normally the PowerPC machines that run NT do not run open firmware. That is also true on PPC one bug. The firmware you have to run on the power stack has open firmware and then runs veneer off a of floppy disk to bridge open firmware to the NT bootloader. It is one of the most convoluted things I've ever seen that someone has actually documented on the internet trying to reverse engineer it for an emulator. It is. I don't know how many committees this entire process passed through. It had to be a lot. I don't actually know when this machine was built. Um, I've got parts in mind that say 94, 95, 96. I do know for a fact that the earlier models had a 603, mine has a 604, so it's either been upgraded or um, it was just built from various spares towards the end of life. Because Motorola actually made an entire subsidiary for this. It was made by the Motorola Computing Group not to be confused with the part with, oh, sorry, not to be completely, not to be confused with the part that they made all the chips with. When Motorola went down in flames, the part that made the chips became Freescale Semiconductors. Uh, most of their other divisions were reorganized and resold, and I believe the computing group was just completely chopped when that happened. So the reason I find the system so interesting is because it will run this, Solaris. Now, if you're not familiar with Solaris, it's a Unix of a completely different color. 
Um, it was, Solaris was made by Sun Microsystems, and Sun Microsystems was the biggest competitor to IBM in the Unix space. And um, there's a very long talk called The Rise of Illumos Development. Uh, it's done by a previous Sun insider who essentially described the situation as Sun being the only company that didn't roll over when Microsoft showed up. I don't know if I actually agree with that, but it does explain the existence of this port. One of, the, one of the big problems was no one knew what was going to happen with the CPU or, um, infrastructure in this era. Everyone thought the x86 architecture was going to die like Vax had 10 years earlier, since the two have a lot in common, including being ridiculously complicated. Sun, um, in the early 90s, had created what was they called the Spark architecture. It was their replacement for the Motorola 680XO chip. And so they had directly competed with Motorola throughout the 80s. The Spark chip had also been recently updated at the time to the UltraSpark, which I actually do think they beat IBM to market for the first consumer 64-bit processor, but I'm not completely sure about that. Yeah, we, we'd have to, I'd have to look that one up. Um, so what makes interesting, Solaris interesting is it's what I call the Solaris line in Unix history. Bell, uh, AT&T, uh, so you know, Bell Labs, they contracted with Sun to create the system release, uh, System 5 Release 4, which was supposed to be the biggest and baddest Unix of all time. Uh, at the time, Sun still had Sun OS, which was derived from the early BSDs. System 5 basically defined the standard for Unix from that point forward. It codified the C library, and most of it, what was done there, would go on to form the single Unix specification in the early 2000s. So, and the idea was anyone could go to Sun, get a license for System 5, and then create their own derivative. Uh, IRIX is based off that, as is most of the other Unixes from the mid to late 90s. They're directly based off the Sun version, sorry, the Sun reference code as created by AT&T. My belief is that the PowerPC port was specifically intended as insurance. If the PowerPC port, if PowerPC got traction with IBM, Sun would be able to sell Solaris on it. They were already selling it for x86 and they had it on Spark. So it also was good for vendors because if anyone was running Unix who wasn't IBM, uh, sorry, if anyone wanted Unix and they weren't called IBM, they could go to Sun and have a pre-made product ready to go. That is actually how uh, both Commodore and Atari essentially got their Unix ports. They got them from Unisoft, who in turn got them from Sun. So the family tree here gets quite fascinating, but there's, this only runs on about three machines, including the one I'm talking about. So to say there's documented information on it is, well, there isn't. So my original plan was I was going to install Solaris or PowerPC on the PowerStack, and I got that far. There is an unofficial compiler for this unicorn because the official one, of course, never got preserved. Uh, I, the idea was I was going to port SDL, SDLNet, and Mixer, and I had done this on the same version of Solaris on Spark. I, couldn't, I didn't think it was going to be that bad. And I ran into problems with the word go because, you know, when GCC says illegal instruction, that's kind of when I was about ready to give up. What it, as far as I can tell, because it is a native PowerPC binary, it's built for a 601 processor and is taking advantage of functionality that is only on the 601. Yes, so if I am going to get this beast running, I am going to have to build a new compiler from scratch. I'm going to have to do a new GCC port, recompile it, cross-compile it, and then recompile it again on the machine itself. I am actually going to do this because I think it's worth documenting the process of, oh, Oh, you have a question? I've got a GitHub for it. I've got a GitHub link. I did this for Solaris. Solaris on Spark. Cool. Yep. Yeah. Well, the problem, the problem is it's a non-standard triplex. It's not PowerPC. It's PowerPC LE, and I don't know if that exists in upstream GCC. No, probably not. I, just would. I had to use old GCC. Well, the, I do have the source code to this version to compile. The problem is it's 295, and 295 is notoriously difficult to cross-compile. Uh, the way I can describe it is it's very sensitive to initial conditions and has a non-deterministic build system, both things that were fixed with the later GCC3. I do have bin utilities, and I do also have the native assembler and linker. So this isn't completely doomed to failure. 
I also have parts, uh, the, so a few years ago, someone actually found the official compiler, but no one could test it for the obvious reason that this doesn't run on anything. Um, I looked at it, I tried to get it to run. It looks like it's a dump of files that came off a development system at Sun, because there was a FlexLM license in there saying that the site name was sunsoft.sun.com. <laughs> Official, you know, the worst part is it might actually be the official compiler, because I can't tell if that's how they shipped it and they left the license in by accident. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Sun Microsystems had some interesting products in this era. Uh, question? So you're saying the 604 is not exactly compatible? No, the, the 601's a superset. Uh, the 601 was basically built directly off IBM's power architecture. Uh, so the, let me give a little bit more lineage here, because this is actually a little unclear. I am talking about PowerPC chips. There is a separate but very similar architecture called Power that IBM was both selling and not selling at the same time. <laughs> and is still sell and still sell it. The, the, the problem is I can't tell if they stopped selling Power for PowerPC and then changed their mind. It's Well, no, PowerPC went away with, with But were there I thought they were also selling power systems in addition to Power it, Look, it's very confusing. <laughs> So, PC exist. Let, let, the biggest problem I've had with this project is my primary source of research is press releases, which have, <laughs> you, can, you can understand why this has been a challenge to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Yeah. So, well, the, 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 this is proof that you get what you pay for with IBM. <laughs> the, the, see, the guy actually showed up and answered my questions. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've actually gotten comments on this on back channels that apparently quite a few IBM alumni have seen my videos. Yeah. And the, co the, the results have been somewhere between, that's neat, and why, why are you making me remember this? <laughs> so, so, let me, oh, so the, this, the, the 601 processor was what we call a hybrid. So it was coming from the original power architecture for AIX in the, released in the early 90s, which was a successful platform for workstations for IBM. And they were transitioning. They were transitioning. Well, okay, they were transitioning to power PC, right? So that was the bridge shit that supported those architectures. So when power PC came out, not everything on the new power PC designs worked if it was compiled with power, because that's the old AIX power machine. Pack. That's the difference. Right. So. Well, this this was an unofficial compiler built like, like the, this was probably built by someone. Well, that's what GCC does by default. So they oh. they built it on a 601. So you gotta everything. I have to rebuild everything because they didn't do MCPU generic because Thank you the, for that. No. yeah it there it used to that's the default now it wasn't the default then and anyone who runs Gentoo will remember the pain of MCPU. So um, this happened to me about two weeks ago, and I went through three attempts to build the cross compiler. Like, I didn't give up here. I should have. I didn't. Um, yeah, so here's the explanation. So yeah, I had it right there. So ultimately speaking, um, I will probably try this again, and I will bring it to VCF. And next time I'll have working netcode. The question is if it'll stay running for the whole show, but um, I'm getting really good at reinstalling that machine. So uh, maybe it'll be a combination of Doom and Watch Me Suffer. Uh, <laughs> all right, I don't remember what the next slide is. <laughs> all right, so here was plan B. So, um, what, so I had mentioned this problems to a few other people, and realistically, I know that it's not uncommon that for the really obscure stuff, it's just going to be sitting at the desktop. I mean, if you were here last year, we had the Alto show up. And there isn't a whole lot of software for the Alto, so it mostly sat on its command line and in Neptune. And 
I figured it was good enough just because the machine itself is so strange. I mean, how often do you see actual hardware from Motorola, especially in a system that has to be started with a key? If you've <laughs> actually been down, um, the keys are down there, so I figured, okay, I'll sit there with an LCD, you know, better than a dead display, and then it stopped booting. I have absolutely no idea. It would start the Solaris kernel, I'd get the spinning prompt, and then I'd just start getting flickering black screens, like, okay. So, so, this is the part of disaster planning that you hope you never get to, and trust me, it didn't stop here. Um, this is something you never want to be doing at a show, <laughs> because I'm not even installing Solaris, I'm installing AIX. <laughs> Sorry, what was uh, that, well, the installer runs in Smitty. Yeah, so what was the question? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, it's Smitty. So this ran for the install for about 45 minutes. And so for all of yesterday, this machine was happy. Right up until this morning. So I believe this is my own fault. I got into a conversation with someone who actually knows more about Unix than like most people like, when I'm watching someone do stuff in the corn shell and I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> it's like, I, I've watched the, the, you know, I'm watching this done. So we get into an entire discussion about this and I said, I do have the boot floppy and the CD here and um, Sun, it's a pretty complete environment when it's running off the CD so I figured there should be no harm in booting it off the uh, disk because this has to boot off a floppy disk which then starts the CD-ROM. It's, and the boot environment's fascinating. It actually loads a copy of OpenBoot, the Sun Boot firmware, and then it completely shows, it gives you an OK prompt with a fourth prompt. Like, like they literally ported open, they literally boot, poured the Spark firmware to PowerPC, have it boot off a floppy disk, because there's a floppy disk for IBM and there's a floppy disk for Motorola. And then it literally starts up like a Spark box, uh, except it's based off the x86 port. Huh? Sounds like it wants to run everything but its actual firmware. No, it's running its actual firmware, it's just in RAM. So you have to remember these even work. Can I remember these are all development machines, not that you're dealing with an environment where firmware is. Except they did that on X86 as well. Oh, did they? Yeah, that that But like like that that I know I completely understand development machines and I normally wouldn't criticize it on that point, but they are they actually shipped this in a different form. Well, let's be honest, a lot, all the good parts that we remember of Unix, a lot of it did come from Sun. We just try and forget all the bad parts. This, this was part of the bad parts. Oh, they were taking a system that wasn't there and just trying to get it into a mode. Well, that, but that was the whole point for Sun's efforts, because they, they were supposed to be the Unix vendor, and they wanted Unix running on everything to be NT. Like, any, anyone could go to Sun and get a System 5 license, and... Let's be honest, there was a lot of, there was Dell Unix, just to give you an idea of how far it went. So, um, I'm not completely sure what it did. It either trashed the NVRAM because it lost its boot entries, or it actually trashed the file system. I'm actually going to give this a try after this talk. I could either boot it off the AIX rescue disk and see if the file system is still there, or we could go for broke and actually try and run the entire install and see if we can get into open windows. It takes about an hour, so, um, I do have a slide for this. We're, oh yeah, well, I'll get to this. It's at the very end. So some of you may be wondering why I do this to myself because, you know, in a previous, you know, I, I am a strong believer in do no harm and yet you, you, you can obviously tell that I'm inflicting harm upon myself by doing this, but there is a reason for the suffering. And the reason for this is it's the only way any of this is ever going to get remembered. By and large, people may remember Motorola for a variety of reasons. Probably no one would ever remember the power stack. In of itself, that's not a big deal, but PowerPC was supposed to be the Intel killer, and had events played out a little different, had Copeland shipped on time, had Intel had problems with the Pentium 2 or Pentium 3, it may have gotten a lot more traction than not. So this is about as close to the, world not, the road not taken as we can conceivably get. But like anything that never made it to market, it has this horrible tendency of disappearing into a black hole. By and large, everything I've demoed here has only been archived in the last few years. Like, most of it's been forgotten except for those who read far too much of stuff about Unix. I mean, 
There is like one Oracle on OS2 for PowerPC. Um, it's actually, there was a machine at Inf the InfoH Museum that could run it, but the one time I tried to run it, uh, see it run, it crashed the desktop and never started again. So it helps to have it on video. <laughs> The, um, a lot of it, what it comes down to is we, I, we have proof that we have the four big ones. We have NT, we have AAX, Solaris, and OS2 are all preserved. There are betas of Copeland, although they are very hard to run. I actually do have the hardware. What I don't have is the debugger, which with Copeland, you need the debugger if you know anything about Mac OS 8 development. The problem is that of all the other major things that were promised, OS2 PowerPC Beta was the, is the only existing version of Workspace OS, the only proof that it existed, and a lot of it's also completely gone. Like, there was like, there were versions of AAX that worked on Workspace OS. It probably never got out of IBM, but is known to exist. There are believed to be, co I, I have heard rumors that there may have been a copy of classic Mac OS that also did, but again, like, my hope is that at someone at one of these companies will see this and help shake loose some of the bits. I mean, if you know Foon on Twitter, Foon basically asked Microsoft for the source code for 3D Movie Maker, and it showed up about a week later. So there is hope in this regard. Um, even if not, I am hopeful that as a community, not just myself, although I'm doing as much as I can, can document and rebuild the history. A lot of what I've been doing has actually been going into the very early history of OS2, the IBM Microsoft partnership, and really figure out what that entire mess of the 90s was without, the, without basically a lot of people speculating on it who doesn't know it. Because let's be honest, when I crack open a book to research this, I find more factual errors about the history than not that I can disprove by looking at the actual product. Like, so that's a lot of why I do put myself through this. As for Doom, uh, it is partially preference. Doom's source code is probably about as portable as early 90s C gets. And being early 90s C, I can put it through pretty much any C compiler and it's not going to complain. Um, for those who are familiar with Visual C++, it is notoriously picky on, the only modern feature it had for many years were C++ style comments. Um, and if I want to get Doom running on something, it has to be run through a native compiler. I usually don't have a lot of choice. Like, I could probably get Chocolate Doom to build with Borland C if I was so determined. It's probably a really bad idea, but I could probably do it. So by getting Doom running on hardware where it does not belong, and let's be honest, Doom does not belong running on AIX sitting in the dining hall here, it gets people talking about it. And this has interesting knockdown effects. When I did my video on pinball, it actually got so much traction that Microsoft Insider Raymond Chen commented on it and, and basically confirmed and elaborated on many of the points about history and in the process debunked a small but relatively well-known bit of internet folklore that Space Cadet Pinball was struck for 64, uh, due to 64-bit compatibility. Similarly, with PowerPC, understanding the full story of why it was created and why it failed helps explain why the Intel monopoly kept going, even in face of Intel itself, but ITAME is entirely different talk. Um, also, it makes a decent YouTube video. I mean, for those who are familiar with Unix, how do you make Unix interesting to people who don't know computers? And my way of doing it was to get one of the most classic vintage games imaginable. Like, even people who are not game gamers will know Doom. And then run it, and then sit down, document the entire process on a platform that no one's really seen. Outside this room, I doubt many people even know what CDE is, CDE is or what a Motif interface looks like, but so it makes the whole thing stand out on YouTube. And so it's already bared fruit, uh, although some of you might go back to the this is no place of honor. Uh, this is AIX on Itanium. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, that, it's those moments you don't get over text. <laughs> so this is, this, I don't, this, it's an i2000 Merced software development vehicle. It's not mine. This is not my photo. Sold that. What company sold that? I, Intel. This was the official oh. development vehicle. Uh, this, I believe this is an HP, uh, any Merced system will run it. Okay. Now, there's a reason why this is interesting, and just to show more AIX in the U name. 
this was the pro this was the, the source of one of the most famous lawsuits. Who remembers Sco? IBM Sco so, sold IBM over this. That they said that um, IBM took Sco proprietary code, put it in AIX, and put it in Linux. This was the entire basis of the lawsuit. This product was known to exist through a lot of legal filings, but no actual copy of it had ever surfaced. So at this point, you know, maybe myself, maybe historians in 20 years who are trying to understand what the SCO, if the SCO lawsuits had any true validity or not, this now exists and can be referenced. They can determine through reverse engineering, because reverse engineering has come a long way in 20 years. Um, determine if there was any validity to the original claims or not. Now, I don't personally believe there is. I believe it was all FUD, but there is something to be said before being able to actually check it for yourself. And a few other things like this have shown up. Uh, this one this one was bizarre because this has been the, the holy grail or most cursed object, depending on who you ask, in some vintage computing circles. And I'm sitting in my Discord and someone just says they have it. That is my Nintendo PlayStation moment. That someone says they have a Nintendo PlayStation in your garage. It's like, prove it? Well, I ate those words. <laughs> Uh, incidentally, we've actually gone uh, GCC ported to it, and we have a native. We've been porting applications to it. We've even gone CDE running natively on it because it has an ATI video driver. So um, it gives you an idea of what is actually possible when a people work together and don't hoard knowledge. Uh, something that is unfortunately common in some areas of vintage preservation, and beyond that. The fact of the matter is things like VCF, my channel, every YouTuber depends on public interest. If people decide tomorrow that vintage computers have no value, it's going, they're going to disappear. So I do see it as, yes, I'm basically shitposting on the internet with vintage computers, but it's for a good cause. Um, and ultimately speaking, I want to set the record straight. Is, was, was Microsoft's takeover of the 90 due to them being a ruthless monopolist, or was it a combination of incompetency by all their opponents? And there's, <laughs> yes, and there, there is arguments for both. Because let's be honest, um, sometimes I feel like Microsoft was the only competent one in the room in the 90s. <laughs> there are moments where you have to wonder the, the collective decision of everyone involved. So, um, I have also been looking at this in a long time. Sometimes it looks back. So, some of this is my opinions. Please don't, you know, I am happy to be proven wrong. If you want to help with the effort, I do have a wiki. I already have 20,000 words written about OS2, which is probably half a novel too long. Um, so, let's go to the closing. I, after this, I am going to take everything I have. I'm going to make a video on the 140 because I think it's worth documenting this more in depth, especially. I have alpha hardware, and you can run the MIPS port and emulation, so I can try all of it side by side. I want to get Solaris PowerPC working, because if nothing else, the idea of Sun, Solaris running on something it has no right to be on is funny. And hopefully we'll have land play next year. Um, beyond that, I have actually formed my own business to continue working on this. So if you are or know someone who works for IBM, Motorola, or one of their descendants that has something of interest, and they may be convinced to at least let me document it, if not actually preserve it, because frankly, I will document something just to make sure it doesn't get lost. Please get in touch, my email is right there. Uh, I am, I'm quite willing to work on whatever person's terms. And if you wanna follow me on socials, there's the YouTube, Mastodon, GitHub, and email. Uh, oh yes, and my final uh, piece of trivia, the slide deck didn't exist until yesterday because everything else went wrong. We went through 100 slides, if you can believe it. That's how long this deck was, and I went through it for 15 minutes on my first try. <laughs> and it's really what happens when you spend too much time with slow computers. So uh, let's, let's take any questions. Uh, we've got about two minutes. Uh, no, they're slow and old computers. Okay. Uh, I can, so, I can th that's a very long discussion. I will sum it up as wrong, do it again, but better, without caring about compatibility. Can I just make a comment about that? I, I worked at IBM, I worked on the early prep I want to hear this, I want to hear this for myself. No, no, I worked on the early prep designs. Okay. And the problem was, IBM was a little large book, still is, little large company with hundreds and hundreds of troops. And they, they don't like each other, and they don't like to talk to each other. But if somebody has great technology, we want to work with them to get it into our product. And they all have their budgets. So, so you have to put all of the belief in it. I felt that this in a working environment for many years. 
So if you ever wonder why there are those weird bullet points for a product that just seem out of place, oh, that, 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 that is exactly how it happens. And that, happens all, that happens at all. All right, uh, we're almost out of time, so let me get any other questions. Okay. But they didn't use it. Of course they didn't. Yeah, New World. Oh, is, ultimately speaking, no one liked each other's flavor of coffee. Exactly. And, and it's All right. Let me, let me get the question back there. All right. Yep. Yes. Uh, they were, it, the R6000 line was marketed for CAD. IBM had an entire line of CAD. They also had the Space Cadet tablet, I believe is what it was called. Yes, yes, yes. Um, they weren't a big name in that space as compared to some, but PowerPCs had a very long lifespan. Um, uh, the Xbox 360 was PowerPC based, as was the Wii and the Wii U. Uh, Cell was a little bit different, but is PowerPC derived.